Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jessica Matthews, president of the Carnegie Endowment for Interna International Peace. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon for what um, I know is going to be a fascinating discussion um, with President Habibi, the third president of the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, we are, uh, we have been honored to host him for the last day and, uh, um, I can tell you we, we will all learn a great deal about the challenges and prospects of Indonesian democracy. Uh, here at Carnegie, we have a very active program uh, that uh, follows uh, developments in Southeast Asia, led by Vikram Nehru, who's going to serve as the moderator for today's discussion. We have been closely following Indonesia's rise as a vibrant democracy, a regional economic powerhouse, and an increasingly important voice on global issues. Arguably, um, that rise would not have happened um, had it not been for President Habibi's leadership during the crucial years of 1989 and, uh, sorry, 1998 and 99, uh, when he held office as president following the nationwide protests that led to the end of Suharto's 32-year presidency. Um, those 570 days, uh, saw both an amazing amount of both political and economic reform, but reform that um, has lasted, has stuck uh, in a truly historic way. During his tenure, President Habibi formed the Development Reform Cabinet to rebuild the nation and prepare, lay the foundations for real democracy. His key reforms, among many, he told us, I hope I'm not stealing anything from that during his 570 days in office, he made 1.3 changes per day. And um, <laughs> I, I told him that he was doing an awful lot better and perhaps he could come and help with the US Congress. <laughs> his key reforms included the abolition of restrictions on the uh, formation of labor unions and political parties, the release of political detainees and the introduction of press freedom. He was also responsible for setting a two-term limit on the presidency, um, a much welcomed move uh, after the two previous long-term presidencies. And, and many of these reforms were introduced in the teeth of very substantial domestic opposition and required considerable courage. As a uh, fallen away scientist myself, a, in my case a biochemist, I'm happy to say that President Habibi was trained as an aeronautical engineer and scientist. He received his doctorate in 1965 from the Technical University of Aachen in West Germany and served as Indonesia's Minister of Research and Technology for two decades. President Habibi now acts as an advisor on the democratization of Indonesia, uh, mainly through the think tank that he and his family established in 1999, the Habibi Center, which has become one of Indonesia's leading think tanks. It was established with the belief that the preparation of that the promotion of democracy and the protection of human rights remained fundamental to Indonesia's future. Um, it's not that often uh, that we get to talk to, listen to, question uh, someone who has made uh, such lasting change on such a major country, on so many people's lives. Uh, and so we are, um, I think, very grateful, very honored to have you with us, and really look forward to hearing your remarks. And President Habibi. Madam, thank you for your uh, introduction. It is almost impossible and misleading to describe 
the Indonesian Reformation by just observing and analyzing the happenings of the last three decades without referring in the almost seven decades of changes that had started, uh, occurred since the Declaration of Independence in the Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I make a remark. Uh, the letters are too small, I can't continue. <laughs> but if I talk free, then it might be too long because uh, that is one of my problems. If I started to talk, I cannot stop <laughs> because there's a lot to tell, but I try to read like that, okay? <laughs> How? So let me give you some information as a brief overview of my rule in the recent Indonesian historical evolution. I call it evolution, not revolution. The historical background, the Indonesian Revolution started 1945 until 1963. 1963, 45 was the declaration of our independence, and 1963 was the fact that Irian Jaya, West New Guinea, was accepted as a part of Indonesia. was inspired by two revolutions. The 26 years American Revolution, 1763 until 1789, when the British colonial master started to reform their colonies in North America until 1789, when the first president of the United States of America, George Washington, was sworn in. So that was inspired by the American Revolution. The second is the 10 years French Revolution from 1789 to 1799. These two revolutions inspired the diverse community of the more than 300 ethnic groups who for centuries have lived peacefully in the only maritime continent of the world. To form a new nation state based on an inclusive national ideology known as Panchasila and a motto of Binika Tungal Ika or unity in diversity. Panchasila consists of two old Japanese words original from Sanskrit. Pancha means five. Sila means principles. It comprises five principles that are inseparable and interrelated. First, believe in the divinity of God. So if you are an artist in Indonesia, you can survive. You can become the richest man of Indonesia being an artist, but you can never lead the country. Because you have to swore belief in God. If you don't believe in God, you cannot do that. But if you are an atheist, you have a lot of money, and you try to make activities which insult people who believe in God, then you are against the Panchasila, the con Indonesian constitution. Then you get a problem. That's why the Communist Party cannot exist in Indonesia. See? It's not that we are against the communists, nothing. But we cannot accept somebody who started to organize, to make activities with, for people and what you call a socialize the idea of 
the non-existence of God. Okay? Like the United States. I think here you are not a, a Christian or whatever, but uh, you started, I think every president and then if he make a speech, he started ended with God. <laughs> so, the second, a just and civilized humanity. Third, the unity of Indonesia. The fourth, democracy guided by the inner wisdom in the unanimity arising out of the deliberation amongst representatives. The fifth, social justice for all the people of Indonesia. These are the five basic principles. We have made a lot of work, research, analysis about that in Indonesia. Sukarno formally introduced Pancasila on the 1st of June 1945 as an ideology comprises between those that want to establish an, an Islamic state and those that wish for a strictly secular state. While Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim-majority nation, there are also sizable other religious minorities. With Pancasila as its national ideology, the Indonesian state attaches great importance to religion while representing religious freedom and pluralism. So as long as you are directly being elected by the people, and you believe in God. It is for me and for any Indonesian, it's not important which way you believe in God. So Buddhism, Hinduism, or Christianity, whatever. But you have to be chosen by the people. That's the most important thing. Sukarno was president for 22 years from 1945 until 1967, and Suharto was president for 31 years, from 1967 to 1998. I was asked to join the government of Indonesia in 1974 to become advisor of the president for advanced technology and aeronautical science, a position that I had held until 1978. That means four years I was the advisor of the prison. In 1978, I became the Minister of State for Research and Technology until 1998, 20 years, continuously. In 19... So President Suharto was re-elected by the People Consultative Assembly in March 1998 for another five years. And after this election, I was elected as the vice president. On Thursday, the 21st of May 1998, President Suharto resigned. And constitutionally, the vice president had to take over the presidency. Now I want to explain a little, give you a little information about the political mechanism during Suharto's leadership. Every five years, an election was held in which two political parties, Partai Democrat, see Indonesia, or PDE, Indonesian Democratic Party, Partai Persatuan Pembangunan, or PPP, United Development Party, and one non-political party of the functional group or Golongan Karya, Golkar, participated in the election. The last election during the 32 years of the Suharto period was in May 1997, when the Golkar won more than 60% votes, while voters' turnout was almost 90%. It's. 
There are five factions at the People Consultative Assembly. Three through election and two based on criteria made by the decrees of the People Assembly and the laws made by the Parliament. After the election, three of the five MP, People Assembly fraction, that means Golkar, the functional group, Abri, the armed forces and police group, and the Utusan Daira, or the provincial functional group, formed a congressional coalition that controlled more than 87% of the chairs in the People's Assembly at that time, in 1997, 1998, for up until 2003. This congressional party coalition during the last 30 years of the Suharto period was one of the strengths of the government in maintaining a sustainable, equitable distribution of education, work, and income, a sustainable economic growth, and a sustainable, sustainable political stability. I became the executive chairman of the coalition in 1998 without any vice chairman. Mostly, the coalition will exist of three factions. East faction had the opportunity to nominate two representatives in the, who coordinate. So you have three times two, six. They are all five chairmen. And then they elect one becoming the Chief Executive Chairman or Chief Executive Officer. In the history of Indonesia in the Suharto period, the first, it is the, I have to add that it is the privilege of the elected president together with the Executive Chairman of the coalition who form the cabinet. So in the first cabinet of Suharto, Suharto was the elect first the elected executive chairman of the coalition. And he operated with from each faction, that means two from the armed forces, they are generals two generals, two from the provinces, because the Minister of Interior Affairs was a general, so the representative of them is also a general, too. And the professional, the, the gold card, the chairman was also a general. And because of that, the first chairman was a general. That's why it is not exaggerated. It's true that at that time they are called, talking about a council of generals. You see, this is scientific, it's okay. They were elected. Okay? So, Suharto was the first executive chairman, and then two, 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 seven, the whole group of seven people are generals. Suharto was the only one who is four star, the other are. I think three or two star, I don't know. I don't care either. <laughs> so so uh, what happened then? And then they make a people assembly. The candidate are many. But then it's competition between Suharto and Nasutio, who's the chairman of the people assembly. And Suharto win and became the elected president. So, the chairman of the coalition and the elected president is the one who formed the cabinet. That means Suharto is Suharto. Okay? 
You said, no, I'm making that. The second cabinet is again so hard to be so hard. The third, again, so hard to be so hard. The fourth, so hard to be Pangabean, is general. But he introduced already some non military in the sixth. That's the fourth. The fifth was Suharto and Sudarmono, also a general and a general. But the civilians come in, the non military. The sixth coalition was Suharto and Habibi, 93. The first time a general and just a man like you and me. A scholar. Still, the vice chairman was no general. I run that. Oh, the duty is, for example, the people assembly must be, it's your responsibility. There are many, many, many things that you have to do. And I've done it. Because of the sex is nine, and I know that the first time I was then <laughs> sitting with Suharto together and making the cabinet. That's why I know for sure that it's two people who make that. In 1998, it was Suharto with Habibi again. But this time, no vice chairman. Alone. So I give you a little insight, okay? But still, these the two people who form the cabinet and so on. There are five factions at the People Consultative Assembly, three through election and two based on criteria made by the People Assembly and criteria made by the Parliament, by law. After the election, three of the five MPF factions who form a coalition, I told you, they control 87 during my time as I was the chairman. No vice chair. I control 87% of the chairs in the People Assembly. 87. It's a lot. And I don't have to consult with to anybody. A big of responsibility. I was protesting. Because I was convinced that it's unhealthy. But my protest was ignored. The Congressional Party coalition during the last 30 years of Suharto period, or I explained that already, I became executive chairman of the coalition in 1998, without vice chairman. I reminded President Suharto that this was not good and at least one vice chairman should be elected. My suggestion was totally ignored. The coalition of the three factions had almost 87 seats in the People Constitutive Assembly, NPR, meeting starting the 11th of March, 1998, headed by one executive chairman, without any vice chairman. The suddenly we started the People Assembly. There's only one who controlled ADZ. We faced the other. In November 1997, my wife had a very crucial open heart 
and bypass surgery in Germany. I informed President Suharto that after serving continuously for more, almost 25 years, I was not able nor willing to serve anymore in order to care for my wife and write books. He just listened and said that Indonesia still need me. In March 1998, separately from the presidential election, the MPR elected me as the vice president, as I told you before. Then, amidst a deep financial crisis and large-scale demonstrations throughout the archipelago, President Suharto suddenly resigned on the 21st of May 1998. Indonesia was faced with a difficult dilemma. Indonesia was at that time constitutionally in the hands of one man during the most critical period in the history of modern Indonesia. The president was Habibi. The vice president was Habibi. The executive chairman, without any chairman of the coalition controlling 87% at the People Assembly and more than 60% at the Parliament, was Habibi. In, nine, in 53 years, since the proclamation of the Indonesian Republic of Indonesia. Sukarno and Suharto Pira, the state's attorney general, was a member of the cabinet on, controlled by the president. This effect is not terrible. During that critical time, first, from the time that President Suharto informed me of his resignation through State Secretary Dr. Sadila Mursi, 12 hours beforehand until his death, he refused to receive me. I get no data. Refused. The only direct communication we had was 90 days, 19 days after his resignation on his 77th birthday where he received my phone call and told me that given the condition and situation of Indonesia to meet the complex multiple crisis, it would be the best if we did not see each other. He asked me to help and bring Indonesia out of the multidimensional crisis. It's a fact. In all big cities in Indonesia, there were continuous demonstrations on the street, and all the media were against the president and this ruling government. I received hourly reports from the national intelligence back in. The intelligence of the army, navy, air force, police, parliament, the people consultative assembly, interior minister, and foreign affairs, none of these reports match 100%. And the result was chaotic. How could I verify the quality of the report? Who was to be trusted? I had no input or data from President Suharto or his staff. It's a dilemma, this is a fact. The situation became worse hourly and unpredictable. The free fall of the Indonesian currency, rupiah, started. Inflation was over 70%. 
and interest rate even higher. Foreign currency reserve became minus, and many banks started to collapse, leading to instability and uncertainty. Large-scale unemployment and growing hardship as people's basic needs could not be guaranteed eroded public confidence in the president and the whole political system with signs of a revolution brewing people predicted that Habibi would not suffice more than 100 hours. Later they corrected and said more than 100 days. And I survived 570 days and doing a lot of sin. And that's the reason I could make efforts every day, 1.3 new laws every day because I control. But I have to work very hard. I have to read. And sometimes I have no time to sleep. So I read it. And it happened to be that my wife is a medical doctor. She was very worried. But I have to. I have to faster than the problem, than the development of the problem. I have to go ahead. High quality, objective input was needed to make both fast and high quality decisions. Given my technical background, I was able to analyze the situation comprehensively and in a systematic and objective manner and rapidly introduced several major reforms measures. I didn't make misuse the fact that I was alone and controlling almost everything. I did the misuse. I make use. I make changes. Why I could do that? Because I was 25 years near the, what do you call that, the power. I saw, but I couldn't do anything. If I protest it, then he listen and say, hey, I can follow your ideas. If God wanted that one day you will lead the country, then you make changes according to your ideas. But today, I'm the president. I do this. So I was saying, okay. At that time, I was not yet vice president. So I said, young man, I, I protested. But you know, if you believe in God, he maybe he was watching. I will show you what will happen. And it happened what I told you. And I was lucky that I didn't misuse it. I make use it. Make a lot of changes. It's in three books in Indonesia, the Indonesian language. All the changes, all the law. So, I was able to analyze the situation comprehensively in a systematic and objective manner and rapidly introduce several major reform measures. There are among them major decisions I adopted immediately after using the presidency. First, avoid and eliminate existing constraints, introduce a predictability and reliable fast relaxation process. If I want to explain to you about the relaxation process, it's long. But I'm sure among you, there are many experts, they know what I mean. Any kind of constraints is high cost. 
whether it's because of people who suffered or because of money, piracy. So you have to do the relaxation. But the relaxation must be so well done that you are not exaggerating. There are certain limited. You know, you are only allowed through the system. So I changed this. I could do that because 25 years training <laughs> and being there every day. Allow only the commander in chief of the armed forces and police to directly meet with me while others must join him to give reports. Before everybody can come, every four star children can come to the prison and say, I say, no, only one. The commander in chief. And you have to coordinate. If you want to see, come with him. Why? I don't have time only for you. And if somebody doesn't live, I just make a note and I change his place. Take another. Give the freedom to demonstrate, speak and report, or give the freedom of press and expression. Look, if you get 10 reports, none of them match. Some of them are against each other. Whom you will follow? If I make a note and give, let's say, to the intelligence, Bakit, he will be happy, but the other became jealous. You see? And if that happened, then I create problem. And I have other problems than the military. I was aware that the military was not united. There are many candidates who want to be the president. I was never planning to be the president. I was not interested. But since I was chosen, I was only interested to solve the problem that I face and to take care that Indonesia will stay as it is. Not like other countries, you know. They make the change from an authoritarian into a democracy and after that, they get it, but they get seven new states or ten new states and whatever. You see the Balkan, Yugoslavia, you see the former UDSSR. It was one and now 17. I was, I was not willing to have that. I have to maintain. I not, was not willing to change the Constitution because the Constitution was rooted in two big revolutions of mankind, and that's the American and the French. The best is you learn from others. And we are all your people, normal people. So with that ratio, you know, way of thinking, I make my changes. So because I get so many reports, which is not confidence to one, but difference, and sometimes against the other, who is going to check that? Oh, let the people who demonstrate on the street check for me. So how to do that? Open. Open the door for telling you me, talk what you want. You may write what you want. Give the chance to them. But if you started to kill people, then you are a criminal. Because of that, suddenly I get a lot of input. <laughs> and I can't check, but I can't make my decision. Okay? I'm not a specialist of uh, press freedom and something like that. Not at all. I have to solve my problem. Not only that, give the freedom 
to all political prisoners except those who are against the constitution and have killed people. So all the political prisoners out. They were faster than the cabinet. The cabinet, you know, I informed the cabinet on Friday, the 22nd of May. So Harto stepped down on Thursday, the 21st. 24 hours later, I announced the cabinet. And after I announced the cabinet, before I say I want to see the authority general, state General. And he came in and he was telling, Sir, I'm not a member of the cabinet. You just, you know, yes, you are not a member. I told him why. But why do you call me? I want you immediately to take care, to give the freedom to all political prisoners. The prisoner is only for criminals. I said, So you cannot do that. Why? I used the the, the way Suharto faced me, oh, well, I'm the president, I told you, you do that. <laughs> okay. But he has done that. He just asked me, is it valid for a certain, his name is Dr. Uh, Sri Bintang. He's an intellectual from the University of Indonesia. Was always protesting. And the other is Pak Paham. He's the leader of the labor union. Is it valid for those actually also valid? It's only not valid who is against the constitution and has killed people on destroy people's houses because they are criminals. And then he went out and he has to make the change. And afterwards, he was not doing as he has to do. For me, it's easy. I don't have to consult. I change him. Take another. Yeah. Who become the author of the general. I can change it because I control 87 percentage. <laughs> I didn't misuse it, isn't it? And the one, they know, oh, that guy. He is a small guy and just smiling, friendly, but don't play with him. <laughs> he just changed. Because I have no time. I have to be faster than the development of the problem. Okay? Give autonomy to the provinces. Allow anybody to establish a political party that accepts the constitution and fulfill all criteria for acceptance to become a political party. Change goal card. into a political party and dissolve the ruling coalition. I was the chairman of the ruling coalition. At 87%, I dissolved it. They say, hey, you are crazy. Why do you do that? Look, I'm going to change Indonesia. That, but not responsible to you, to everybody. That's why I've done my job for the election, the coalition, I dissolved it. And they predicted, oh, that's the best mistake, the big mistake you made. I don't care. And then I changed the Golka, who is not a political, changed. And then changed the structure. And after that, I make myself not available. Because I have to change Indonesia for the Indonesian people, including the minorities. I act inclusive, not exclusive. Inclusive. I took the best daughter and son of the country. I don't ask which religion you have, which party, no. I followed the track, I said, that's the guy. And I make that, and call with him. And they are one uni united, and they, they work very hard with me to make the changes. 
solve the East Timor problem in conformity with the Constitution. Be inclusive and care for 100% to the people of Indonesia, including those who are not represented in the People Assembly and had not participated in the election. Then announce the new cabinet within 24 hours. These are the pointers I follow. And I make my decision. I couldn't consult anybody. Anybody want to know what is that guy doing now? So I don't talk. Even my wife, I don't explain because if I uh, tell my wife, she will be uh, worried and then maybe she will be more sick and so on. So I just saw in that time, you know, I feel you have so big influence in a society of two, almost 200 million people at that time. And maybe you are the most lonesome man <laughs> or person in the world. And you have to smile while inside you are crying. And you cannot sleep because you are worried of many innocent people who are suffering. And you have only one thing in mind, how to help them as soon as possible without having blood in your hand. That was the attitude. On Friday, the 22nd of May, 11 o'clock in the morning, in the same place, at the same time, at the Merdeka Palace, where 24 hours earlier President Suharto had announced his resignation, the new cabinet, Cabinet Reformasi Pembangunan, or Reform Development Cabinet, was introduced. For the first time in the history of the Republic of Indonesia, the governor of the Central Bank, Bank Indonesia, and the State Attorney General were not included in the new form cabinet, Reformasi Pembangunan. They were out. Before the bank, governor of Bank of Indonesia was a member of the cabinet, not a scholar. So they protested. The scholar protested against me. Oh, you are an engineer, you know nothing about that. I do nothing, but I'm the president, I change. Why do you change? Because my interpretation, the man who will make money is committed to deliver the highest quality of money and not based on my direction at the prison of anybody. It must be real scholar, professional people. And they are responsible not to the president, but to the parliament. There were no changes. If you want to sue me, you sue me. But not now. And then I change, I make the law. I have done that within 24 hours. <laughs> so hard to step down. 10 o'clock in the morning on Thursday, 21st, and 22nd, 10 o'clock in the morning, I announced the cabinet without the governor of Bank of Indonesia and the Autonomous General. Without. And they protested, hmm, you may sue me later. But before they sue me, I changed them. <laughs> the law. Of course. I learned. It's just not my idea. It's the idea for many people. You do, do not need to be a scholar, but you, I, you, I leave it to the scholar, give the direction, and then check. Believing is good, but checking is better. <laughs> I trust him, too. Afterward, I check. It's not good. Give it back. Want to change. As easy as that, but must be very fast. So, in this style, I was mending my problem. And that's why I make 1.3 new laws and new presidential decrees all together, 1.3 every day, including Sunday. 
<laughs> For more information, please read my two books written by myself. It was translated into English and German and uh, Mandarin, Chinese. And there's the book of Decisive Moment and the book translated in German, Arabic, Chinese, and Japanese is about Habibi and I, and about myself and my wife. You know, as my wife passed away, I was almost crazy because I didn't know that my wife has cancer. I was only informed only two months before she passed away. And I was married 48 years and 10 days, and suddenly she passed away. And after she was well, in the cemetery of the heroes, like here, Arlington, there, uh, where the president of the country was the one who made the ceremony. I was there. Only one week after that, we find out that around 10 o'clock I get a depression. And I was walking without shoes in my pyjama, full conscious, crying like a child and looking for my wife. And they did say, hey, that guy who has made so many decisions, so big influence, I think he must be crazy. So they reported to the medical doctor team and they say, Habibi is very ill, has psychosomatic malignant because of deep sorrow, a negative synergy among his all the organs, kidney, whatever, started. And they predicted he will follow his wife in three months. So they come to see me, explain that, and give me four options. First option, go into psych psychiatric clinic or for crazy people. Second, stay at home, and the medical doctor team will treat me at home. The third, I should tell all my sorrow to a team, and the fourth, I should write. I take the fourth option and wrote with a laptop, not with many ink, but many tears. I wrote it in two and a half months. After two months, months, I was normal. And then they say, hey, what have you done? I said, I read it. And they read, they said, I think you have to publish that. Why? Because this is not your case. This is the case of anybody who loves each other between mother and child, or father and child, father, mother and son, you know, or husband and wife, whatever or friends, they will have that problem. We cannot solve it. And then we publish. It become a bestseller in Indonesian language, and it has been translated in Chinese, Mandarin, and Japanese, in Arab, in German, in English. And they make a movie. Not with me, with movie star. All that, you know. And the movie was watched by, in the theater, by around uh, four to five million people. But uh, through DVD and YouTube and so on, it began to sell DVD. It's, according to statistics, over 100 million people have watched that. So you can, you can read that. You can see the movie. And please read also Democracy Take Off, the BG Habibi period, edited by the by Divi Fortuna, Professor 
Dean Fortuna, and Professor Bridge Welsh, with articles of 15 scholars from Australia, Canada, Germany, Malaysia, the United States, and Indonesia. Now the question is, where is Indonesia going? How will the future be? First, the values of the Panchasila and Constitution must be developed further, adjusted to the progress of globalization and achievement in science and technology. Second, the quality of information must be immediately updated and speedily. Third, human resources development must get the highest priority by using state-of-the-art education and upbringing system, smart networks, and internet. Fourth, unemployment must be as low as possible, less than 3%, but given priority to domestic product with minimum 70% value-added local content. The middle class needs to become larger and stronger and play an important role in the cultural resilience, quality of the human resources, and economic growth of Indonesia. The sixth, Indonesia has to become an important element of the bridge between ASEAN and the United States, as well as ASEAN and Europe. So this is a small, you can get a copy. I asked them to make a copy. You can read it. If you want more, you can contact the Habibi Center here. Uh, she is um, educated here in the United States. So she sp speak better. Uh, why do you stand up, Ima? <laughs> yeah, that is it. <laughs> she can contact her. And uh, she's looking forward, you know, to get uh, more information and possibilities of how we could cooperate for the benefit of both of our society and the world. We will, I always say in Indonesia, if it's ended, let us work very hard and make the world, starting from Indonesia and all our friends, in this case the United States and Indonesia, to change the world, becoming a waiting room or place for the heaven and not for the hell. <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, President Habibi. Why don't yeah. you come and sit down, get some rest? Uh, President Habibi was referring to the Habibi Center. We have the executive director here, uh, Ima Abdul Rahim. And if you Google uh, the Habibi Center, you'll get all the information that you need uh, to, to contact her if you want uh, any more um, information about uh, President Habibi's accomplishments and what he's trying to do now in Indonesia. All right, let's, uh, President Habibi has very kindly agreed uh, to answer questions from the audience. So uh, raise your hand, and when, uh, you, when I do acknowledge you, please wait for the microphone. Uh, give us your name and your affiliation, and then if you could pose a brief question, that will be uh, very much appreciated. Yes, there's a lady right here. Let's wait for the microphone. We'll take one question at a time. Yes. yes. Sir, having accomplished... Could you so introduce yourself, please, ma'am? Oh, I'm Mary Ritter, and I'm here because I'm a friend of Jessica's. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I was a journalist, and I have been in your country frequently as a consequence. I remember how wonderful your days were. Now, why don't you re-seek the presidency? What? Why don't you... <laughs> Why don't you become president again? Why don't you become president again? Why don't you stand for the presidency again? <laughs> you know, I'm 78. Young. Oh. <laughs> the risk that I will become in another dimension, like my wife, is bigger. Maybe that's I was young. But, you know, that is first. The second reason is 
I'm looking forward to advise whoever who is directly being elected through the democratic system becoming the leader of our country. You know? And I think, and I write books now. I'm writing a book, you know, and that is maybe, uh, I know if I have to work uh, again like that, maybe I will not have the time to assist young people. I, I'm assisting young people. Maybe ada buku yang 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 putih itu yang dengan oh kena yang bahasa Indonesia diperlihatkan oh you know if I'm in Indonesia that question is not only for you for young people of Indonesia I was once in a what you call it in a public meeting television you know and there are many people, maybe 500, 600. They, they, they admit to, this is not true. You can see it in the YouTube now. And they come from Sumatra, from everywhere from the country. They just want to see me and listen. So there were many questions. One of the questions was, sir, make yourself available becoming a prisoner. Now I answer as I answered before, but they were not satisfied. And then I told him, you know, it's difficult for me because I want to be sure I'm not going to make, I'm not allowed to make any risk. And risk not for me, for the whole society. And that means for me, rationally it's better than a young man Young men could be between, be, what age? Between 40 and 60. Those who are older than these men, why are you only promoting 60? Oh, come on, 40 and 60. If you are plus minus 10, yeah, we, we can talk, but we need your track record. What have you done? How is your vision? How is, what is, how is your ability to implement things, to make changes? Are you willing to make changes? So there I'm going to assist my intellectual children and my intellectual grandchildren. You see? And then they have written me 50 questions, 50, through the internet. And they ask. They call me now in Indonesia, Eyang. Eyang is grandfather. I'm the grandfather of the nation, they call, told me. You are the grandfather of the children. And they said, you are our grandfather. You have millions of intellectual grandchild and grand -grand, uh, child and grandchild. So they came together. After I give a lecture, there are, I'm not exaggerating, uh, between 3,000 and 12,000 people, or young people. And my son, who is 51, Ilan, was accompanying me. He told me, you are like a rock star. Look at that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it is. <laughs> and then I wrote the book. I answered the question. And they asked photos. It just came out one week before I, went. I left for Indonesia to come here. And it's a bestseller book. It became a bestseller. Many young people, they read. But for me, it's better to write and to give ideas to the people. Because they know that guy has made changes. Look, I came in Indonesia. I get the chance to develop an industry for high tech. I had my background in Europe, in Germany. You know, you can read it in the internet. And as I came back, they allow me, even I became minister, whatever, to to make that changes. But as I became vice president, based on the constitution, I was not allowed to lead the company. So I have to hand over the company which I have developed in almost a quarter of a century. You know how much I 
again, a company of 48,000 people with a turnover of 10 billion US dollars. It's not owned by me. And then with, with on top, I changed, but I told you. So, you see, it's about time that I write, inspire people, give them advice what to do and what not to do. I think that this better for all of us, I tell you all of us, including the people here in the United States or Europe, and to do in such a way that you, you can really change that the world become a waiting room <laughs> for the heaven and not killing each other. All See. Right. Let's get That's some more. Fun. Let's get some more. Because lots of people want to ask questions, President Hariri. Gentleman at the back first. I'll come to you in a second. Yes, please. Hi, President Hariri. Uh, my name is Jeremy Aoyong from the Straits Times of Singapore. Uh, I, you think you've given a very good to-do list for the next president of <laughs> Indonesia. I just wanted to get your sense of between Prabowo and Jokowi, who do you think <laughs> who do you think will be better at implementing your to-do list? And are you going to publicly support any one of them? I no, I'm not allowed. I'm not willing and allowed. Because it is not educate, uh, what you call it, um, educative. Uh, yeah? You know, my, my English is spoiled by my German. Because my education, my bachelor, master, and PhD, and professor is all in Germany. I speak fluently. I speak a fleece of Deutsch. So my English has a German accent. <laughs> Not an Indonesian accent. So uh, it's better for, for all of us, Indonesia, including Singapore, you know, if we will give to the people to elect one. Which they want. If it is fair being elected, okay, then we all support that he has to do the work, perform what he has promised. And he, if he fails, then we can still sue him. There's a constitution and everything. It's okay. Uh, and so in this case, it is not wise for me as their grandfather. <laughs> Okay, uh, intellectual grandfather to say, oh, I am for you, for you. No, it's wrong. Okay? All right, let's have the lady right here in the front, uh, and I'll come to the back in a second. Let's have one more question from the front here. Please introduce yourself again in your television. Thank you very much for your remarks. I'm Patty Marcus. I'm director of Asia Pacific Initiatives. I was fortunate enough to live in Indonesia from 1997 to 2000, working for USAID and very actively involved in the transition to democracy. Um, and having not been there for a long time and been there recently, looking at the changes in the skyline and, and all of the commerce and everything going on. But certainly corruption, graft, and discrimination against many people is still a very serious issue. So I'm wondering what guidance you might give to the new president uh, whomever that may be coming in, uh, and just in general, how to deal with these very serious issues that impact moving forward and development. I answer? Yes, please. Corruption and discrimination. Yeah. yeah. First, the democratization process of Indonesia does last 60 years. United States has experienced more than 200 years with changes. Why should we do it in 10 years? You cannot do that. Or you have to make a revolution. If you make a revolution, it's still a question that you can do that. You will achieve that. What we can do is an accelerated revolution. And there we learn from other people. So, in this case, very important is our attitude. And that is being reflected in the Constitution and the laws. We make changes. For example, before 
by the, the, the interpretation of the Constitution. Let's say this. In the Constitution, it's written that the Bank of Indonesia is committed to help the President of the Republic of Indonesia to build the country. It's logic. Okay? The Bank of Indonesia, who print the money, is headed by a governor. It's normal. Now, Sukarno, as well as Suharto interpretation was, because you are based on the Constitution, committed to help me to build the country, and I am building the country, and I am elected. So because of that, you become my assistant. If you are my assistant, you are the member of the cabinet. You are under my command. So from Suharto until my time, the governor of the Bank of Indonesia was a member of the cabinet. He sit together with the minister and talk about who face other things. And is responsible to the president. And if the president doesn't match with the interests of the president, then he said, no. You know, that happened. So then I came. I said, no. Because he has to help me in what? Creating a high quality of money. For that, it is not the politician who has to do that, what to do. It's not the scholar. And you are not responsible to the politician, in this case the president, to the people assembly. I make a change the interpretation of the law. I didn't change the what you call it, constitution, the interpretation. So I say, because of that, the Governor of the Bank of Indonesia is not a member of the cabinet. I get protests. Protests of scholars who had their PhD in economics in one day and so on. I, I just, I'm just a normal engineer who makes airplanes. See? And then I told him, well, come, be quiet. You may sue me later. But before this, we are changed and make the law. And after me, my successor, whatever, they want to bring it back as the time of Sukhan and so on. It's not possible because the law. And the law is just not from here. Scientifically, we can study. We have enough people. And we have advisors also from Europe and the United States. It's OK. And now we are happy. See? So, in this case, Indonesia will improve, you know, their, not revolution, the accelerated evolution. They learn from their mistake and they mistake others. See? And from that, you know, they improve, they make, they, uh, improve is the right uh, uh, definition. Improve the existing law or regulation. Yeah. So the corruption in this case, yeah, of course, we are working very hard. And we are doing a good job. But you have to educate the people. Yeah. And you cannot expect that because you open the door, democracy, and suddenly you say, hey, because you change the door, you have to be like the United States, like Germany, and you went to more than 200 years have changed it. It's not fair. Clear, isn't it? And in, in this case, uh, I have to admit, for example, I'll give you a nice example. I was in Germany. I was interviewed by some journalists. 
They are my friends. They should not vote for my friend. They said, don't bother me. We have the result of the election. So what? Look, I worry. Because the Islamic parties, there are four. They have all together one third. Four. Four. I'm worried. It goes in the wrong direction. Hey, look at your country. You have the CDU, Christian Democratic Union. You have CSU, Christian Socialist Union. It's all Christian. You put them all together, they're almost 42%. At this, there's two, and it is four, and they have less than 33. Why are you worried, Mr. Tan? Islam is not identical with terrorists. Why can you accept, in this case, in your country? Okay. <laughs> so I want to tell you, we learn a lot from you. That's the best. But we cannot copy. Look this. Mankind started to think, to use his brain, for 200,000 years ago, as the Homo sapiens started. Okay. The religion in the Middle East, Abrahimi, in India, and in mainland China started 5,000 years ago. Not longer. Islam is 1,400 years. Hey, it is nothing against 200,000. At the time that the Somo Sapien was there, if I cut my brain, my head, and you, it's the same system. Only the shell is different. The system is the same. The intellectual software in your system, your body, is the same as in mine. Okay. The intellectual software first was developed and was in your hardware come in 200,000 years ago. The oldest is the culture. It decided your behavior. And not to think about technology to face whoever. And even the belief in God on the way at that time. Just 5,000 years ago in three places, they meet, you know, they, until today they, they maintain and they try to answer the question, why is she dead and where is she? Why is she born? Where did he come from? Etc., etc. You know, democracy is just, you cannot say, hey, democracy, they're the people, but the way is my way. If not, this is not democracy. No. The culture has decided. And that is valid for United States, for Europe, for Indonesia, for Singapore, for Malaysia, for ever. We have to, to know that. Ah, so uh, uh, maybe uh, if there's a chance, we can go deeper. <laughs> All right, okay. let's get one last question because we're coming up to uh, uh, 3.30. Uh, somebody at the back, because I've been taking the front. Let's take gentlemen. Yes, right at the back there. Uh, who's that? Yes. <laughs> Natalie, yes. Thank you, Park. Um, I'm Natalie Sambi from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and a visiting fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Uh, you presided over... Don't, don't speak, uh, speak so fast. I, I, <laughs> my English is not so good. If you speak fast Indonesian, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, you presided over one of the most challenging times in relations between Indonesia and Australia, and you stopped our troops going to war over the annexation of East Timor. What advice and what lessons do you have for leaders of both our countries 
if we are really going to make this waiting room for heaven. Is the failure. The problem we face in the world are the problem of failures. And the root of the failures is the synergize of your culture, your belief, your religion or belief, and your ability to think scientifically. Three elements. And this failure is one of the biggest problems. You know, in, I have given to she's like my sister. She's there, Ms. Ellen Master. I just visited her at home. She's really like my older sister. I gave her a book, which I've written, eh, Ellen? And if you read the book, it's translated in Chinese in Mandarin. It's difficult, you know. You cannot publish a book and ask them to translate because they, you need the approval. It is the other way around. They ask me whether they may translate it into Chinese Mandarin. I ask them why. Because it is concerning love. If you read the book, you go into the detail, you find out that love has five basic principles. Love to the people surrounding you, starting from your wife, your family, your friends, and so on. Love to the product, intellectual product, intellectual right, whatever, of the people, including your enemies and your comp competition. Love to your environment where you live. Love to your job. If you are a journalist, you love your job, journalist. If you are a biologist, you love that. Love to your job. And the fifth, for those who believe in God, love to God. It's the highest. For those who don't, don't believe in God, love to the evolution and science and technology. It's okay. If you dwell deeper, then you get the answer. How to make, to make changes, to make the world, starting for your own society, a waiting room, of the heaven. Well, Mr. Abbott is coming to <laughs> Washington, and I'm sure you'll convey that uh, particular message uh, to him. Uh, all right, I think, uh, uh, President Habibi, thank you very much. You spent an hour and a half with us.